This is section 3.1, Derivatives of Polynomials and Exponential Functions. The first objective is to use the power rule to find derivatives of polynomial functions and then explain how this power rule will make it simpler to determine differentiability at the joint of a piecewise function. So first we're going to connect to our old knowledge. The word derivative is a synonym for slope. And the slope of any function, or of any horizontal line, is always going to be zero. So what that means for us is that if f of x equals a constant, the graph of which will be a horizontal line, then the derivative of that f of x is going to end up being zero. What that also means for us is that the derivative of constant function, always, 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 no exceptions, will be zero. So we have our first shortcut derivative rule where we no longer have to compute this limit, we can just recognize that it's a constant and take the derivative and get zero. To apply this constant rule, we can see that the derivative of a constant will be zero. Here we have the constant written as the number e cubed, but it's still just a number, so the derivative of it will again be zero. Here we have the derivative of an irrational number. It's just a number, so its derivative will be zero. So now let's consider a generic power function that looks like f of x equals x to the n. If we write our formal definition of the derivative as this derivative of x to the n, it will be the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h, so I've plugged an x plus h into here and ended up with an x plus h raised to the n minus an x to the n over h. Now what we can do is we can expand this using the binomial theorem or Pascal's triangle. So if you remember your Pascal's triangle, we started with the 1. These were the coefficients of our expanded binomials. I don't know if you remember this, but let's say I had a plus b to the 0 power, a plus b to the first, a plus b squared, this would be cubed, this would be the fourth, and these are the coefficients. So if we continued this Pascal's triangle, we'd end up seeing a pattern that comes from where we are in the triangle for this particular list of coefficients, and that pattern was put together in what was called the binomial theorem. So that binomial theorem, we can see that leading coefficient of 1, because no matter how many times I go down, I'm going to get a 1. Then we can see the next coefficient is an n, so here's our 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, on and on and on. Then the next coefficient will end up simplifying to this, so I'm just going to expect you to trust me on this because we don't have time to develop the whole binomial theorem again, but we can see that as we multiply this all out, we're going to get a whole bunch of terms, and the first term will have a leading coefficient of 1, as will the last term. The next ones will have n and n, and they'll just kind of be symmetric until we get to the middle. So what I'm interested in doing is writing this out in an expanded format enough that I can work with it. So here's this x plus h to the n. I've written my first three terms and my last two terms, and then we've got all this stuff in the middle. And then I'm going to subtract this x to the n, and again, it's all over h. So remember that the goal is to simplify this limit. So we're going to let h go to 0, and right now we've got an h on the denominator. So we can't compute the limit until we get rid of this h. The beauty of this binomial theorem expansion is that we can see that this x to the n and this x to the n are going to cancel out. So everything that's left is going to have a power of h in it. So if I factor that h out, <coughs> then I would have an h times this without an h. This h would go down to a 1. This one would go down to an n minus a 2. And this one would be an n minus a 1, because each h lost a power of 1. So now when I cancel, notice that I'll have left this n x to the n minus 1 plus this coefficient times x to the n minus 2 times an h plus all the way down to this last one. Now what's nice about this is that every single term has a factor of h in it except for the very first one. So when h goes to 0, all of these extraneous extra terms are going to disappear because they turn into zeros. So we're left with just this nx to the n minus 1. 
This is pretty powerful for us, this power rule. This is the one that half the physics kids have known and been wanting to use for a while. And now everybody gets to use it. And what it tells us is that when we take this derivative of a function that looks like an x to the n, we don't have to go through this long, drawn-out derivative process because every single time it's going to end up looking like this. So we can shortcut and use the power rule to take the derivative now instead of backtracking to the definition of the derivative. Looking at this, we need to see what's going on with the pattern. We have the base, which is the variable x, and we're raising to a number power. So that power comes down in front, and then it gets reduced by 1. So if we want to differentiate these ones on the bottom using the power rule, we can see that I've got a power of 2, so the derivative will bring that 2 down in front and then reduce that 2 by a power of 1. So we just get a 2x. On this one, we'll do the same thing, and we'll get a 5, because we bring that power down in front, times an x raised to the fourth power. We're going to reduce that power by a 1. On this third one, part C, we bring the 25 down in front and reduce the power by 1. The beauty of the power rule is that it works even when the powers are not whole numbers. So they can be fractions, they can be decimals, they can be positive, they can be negative, and we can still take the derivative. So as long as we can make the thing that we're taking the derivative fit the power rule format, then we can use the power rule. So that means we want to rewrite this as a power of x. And if you remember, the index of the root goes on the bottom of the fraction if we rewrite it as a rational exponent. Now I can apply the derivative rule and get a 3 halves x to the 1 half, which will be a 3 halves root x. Now typically what will happen is if we start with roots, we're going to end with roots in the answer key. So you want to be able to go back and forth between these rational exponents and the radical notation. Here. We will be taking the derivative. Again, we want to rewrite this as x raised to a power. And so we need to remember our power rules, <coughs> excuse me, our exponent rules, so that when we take a fraction over something with a power, that's the same as x raised to the negative power. So now it fits that x to the n format. So I can bring the n down in front and then reduce this by 1. So negative 5 minus 1 is going to give me negative 6. And again, since we started with a fraction, we want to end with fraction notation. Last one, before I do the derivative, I want to get this written as x raised to a power. So how do I figure out what that power is? Well, this is an x squared times an x to the 3 fourths. And we remember that repeating the bases with multiplication means that we have to add the exponent. So I have 8 fourths plus 3 fourths gives me 11 fourths. Fourths. Now I've set it up into the x to the n format, so I can apply the rule and get 11 fourths x to the subtract 1 from this, and I will get 7 fourths. So here with our derivatives, we are going to discover that for many of the operations, they behave a lot like we would hope they would behave. So just like limits, our intuitive gut is going to be true for a lot of things. And the three that are going to be the most easy to work with, or the easiest I should say, are the constant multiple rule, the sum rule, and the difference rule, which pretty much says if I have a function and I multiply by a constant and then take the derivative, it's going to give me the same result as if I differentiate the function first and then multiply by the constant. If I want to add two functions and then compute the derivative, that's the same as computing the derivative separately and then adding them. Same for the difference. So what this means is you're going to apply these rules without even paying attention. If I look at this first one, I can just move this derivative through each term individually, and when I hit a constant, I'm going to move through it and take the derivative of what's left. So here, if I take the derivative of x to the 8th, that's an 8x to the 7th. Then I move through the plus, I move through the 12, 
and then I'm going to multiply by the derivative of x to the fifth, which is 5x to the fourth. Then I move through the subtraction, move through the 4, I hit the x cubed. The derivative of x cubed is a 3x squared. Move through the addition, move through the 3, now I hit the x squared, its derivative is 2x to the 1. Move through the 11, then I hit the x, the derivative of the x, it currently has a power of 1, so I bring down the 1, multiply by x to the 0 power, and then the last one is just a constant, so the derivative of that 15 is 0. So if we simplify this, we'll get 8x to the 7th plus 60x to the 4th minus 12x squared plus 6x plus 11, and we're done. So what we want to do is see how we could have gotten to this form right here without having to do all the intermediate work. So we're going to do the shortcut version here. If we look up here, we had a 12 and then a 5x to the 4th. So this 60 came from multiplying that 5 by the 12. Well, we can skip this step and just come right here and see that I'm going to bring this 8 down and multiply it by the 3, so 24 x to the seventh. This one is a linear term and the slope of that line is just a negative 2 and then the slope of a constant is 0. So we end up with a 24x to the seventh minus 2. Our last example, <coughs> again we're going to want to rewrite these as powers of t before we try and apply the power rule. So this is a 4t to the 1 half minus a 5t to the negative 1 plus a 3t to the pi. If I now apply the power rule, I'm going to move this 1 half down in front and multiply, so I'll have 2 of those t's, then I subtract 1, it's a negative 1 half, move the negative in front, I'll get a positive 5t to the subtract 1, negative 2, plus move the pi and multiply by what's in front, and then reduce that power by 1. So if I finish, I want to make sure I give the same sort of format that the original had. So this one involved a root, this one was a fraction. So I'll have a 2 over a root t, plus a 5 over a t squared, plus a 3 pi t to the pi minus 1. On these three, we're looking at whether or not we can go backwards. So we've got to remember that f prime of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus, I guess I should put an a here, f of a plus h minus f of a over h, or f of prime of x will be the limit as x approaches a, of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So if we can recognize this format when I have a's plugged in, or when I have f of x's, it makes it easier to figure out. So this will actually be the derivative of some function at a. So if we can figure out what the function is, then we can take the derivative using the shortcut and plug in one-third. So let's back up and look at our a plus h. So a plus h was plugged into a function, and we got out 4 times that a plus h to the fifth. So that means that f of x, if I take this whole box and turn it into an x, I'm going to get 4x to the fifth. So if I recognize the function and the fact that this here is the derivative, then I can simply take the derivative of that function using the power rule, and then evaluate it at one-third. So I'll plug in that one-third raise it to the fourth power, and I get 20 over 81. This was much simpler than had I written this out raised to the fifth power. So let's do the same thing on this one. Here we've got the second format for the derivative. So this is f prime evaluated at some number a, and look that we can see that a is either here on the bottom 
or here on the bottom. So we see that in both of these cases, the a is a 2. So if I can figure out what f of x is, then I'm going to be able to get that derivative pretty quickly. Well, in this particular format, the f of x is really easy to recognize because it's just that first term. So here we can see that the f of x is an x to the fifth. So if my f of x is x to the fifth, then f prime of x is going to be 5x to the fourth, and I can very simply plug a 2 into that f prime. So I have a 5x to the fourth, which will be 5 times 2 to the fourth, which is 5 times 16, or 80. Last one, this again is the h format, so we're looking for the a, and we can see the a right here is a 2. So this will be the derivative evaluated at 2. So our goal is to figure out what that f of x is so that I can take the derivative. Remember that this a plus h, that 2 plus h is what got plugged into the function. So we can see right here that both of these are involving that a plus h. And if I replace the a plus h with an x, I can read my function off. It's a 1 half x cubed minus a 1 third x. So that f of x is a 1 half x cubed minus a 1 third x. If I take the derivative, I'll get a 3 halves x squared minus a 1 third. And the goal is to find f prime of 2. So if I plug a 2 in, that's a 4 times a 3 halves gives me a 6 minus a third will give me 18 thirds minus 1 third is 17 thirds. With example 6, now we're starting to look at some application types of problems little story problems where we have to work a little harder. It says, I want to find the points on the curve where the tangent line is horizontal. Well, we know with horizontal tangent lines that the slope is going to be 0. So I'm really looking for when f prime of x equals 0. What's nice is I can get the derivative of f pretty readily. That'll be a 4x cubed <coughs> minus 12x plus 0, and then to figure out when that equals 0, I can factor out a 4x, which will give me an x squared minus a 3, and I can see that that's going to equal 0 when x is 0 or when x is plus or minus root 3. So to find the points to answer the question, we will know that our x-coordinate is 0, our x-coordinate is negative root 3, or our x-coordinate is positive root 3. To get the y-coordinates, I'm looking for points on the curve, so I'm going to plug them back into the original function. If I plug 0 in, I get a 4. If I plug a negative root 3, I'll get a 9 minus an 18. That's a negative 9 plus 4 gives me a negative 5. And if I plug in a root 3, I'll get the same negative 5. So what's happening graphically is we have a fourth degree polynomial. It should look like a W or an M. And we have a horizontal tangent at 0, 4. And then at negative root 3, negative 5. And at positive root 3, negative 5. So our graph is going to look something like this. Horizontal tangents at these three locations. With example 7, we're asked for the x-intercept of a tangent line. Well, we can't get the x-intercept until we have the equation of the line. So every line's equation requires a point and a slope. The point, we know the x or excuse me, the x coordinate is 2. I can get the y coordinate by plugging a 2 in. So I'd have an 8 minus a 28. That's a negative 20 plus 13 gives me a 7. And we also need the slope, which is a synonym for the derivative at that point. So in order to compute that slope, I'm going to take the derivative of this, and then I'm going to evaluate it at x equals 2. When I do that, I'll get a 12 minus a 28, which gives me a negative 16. Now I've got the point, and I've got the slope. I can write the equation of the line, which will be y equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate plus the y-coordinate. The goal is to get the x-intercept of that line. So remember, the x-intercept will be a number 
with an output of 0. So we'll plug in y equals 0 and we'll distribute that negative 16. If I isolate x now, I will get a 39 negative divided by a negative 16, which will give me a 39 sixteenths as my x-intercept. With example 8, again a little different. We want to find the parabola that has this equation whose tangent line has the given equation. So what we're looking for are the a and the b. That means we've got two variables. So buried in this problem some way, I'm going to come up with, or somewhere, I'm going to come up with two equations involving a and b, because I'm going to have to have a system of equations in order to compute those. So the first equation will come from the fact that 1, 1 is on the curve. That means if I replace x with a 1 and I replace y with a 1, I will get a true statement. So my first one is 1 equals a plus b. So there's the first equation in my system of equations. The second equation is going to come from information given to us in this tangent line. Now remember tangent lines come from a point on the curve and the slope at that point. So what this is telling us is that the slope at the point 1, 1 is 3. So that's telling us that f prime, if I plugged in a 1, is going to give me a 3. That means if I take the derivative of this and I plug in a 1, I'm going to get a 3. So there's my second equation involving a and b. So to solve this system of equations, probably the simplest method will be to do elimination. I can subtract this second equation from the first. I'll get a negative 2 equals a negative a, which means a is 2. I can substitute back in up here. 2 plus something gives me 1, so b is going to be negative 1. And so the equation of my parabola is 2x squared minus x. With example 9, if you think graphically about this, I'm missing my f, so add that in. If you think graphically, we have a v that has been moved 2 to the right and 3 up. And I'm asking for the derivative at the corner. So without doing any work at all, we can see that the derivative does not exist. Now the last problem, number 10, is a little more tricky. And the reason it's tricky is we have a piecewise function and I'm asking whether f is differentiable. So prior to this point, we would have to do the um, analysis the same way we did in section 2.9 and we'd have to look at the left-hand derivative and the right-hand derivative and determine whether or not they work. Well, what's nice about the power rule is that it enables us to shortcut this process and not have to backtrack to that definition of the derivative. So how it can help us is that if the function is differentiable, then we know it has to be continuous. So we can write f is differentiable at any value x equals a if two things happen. f is continuous at a and the limit on that derivative function as we approach a exists. So f continuous means that the two branches meet each other and then this second statement says that the slope coming from the left and the slope coming from the right are both going to the same value. So as long as both of these conditions are met then f will be differentiable. So what does that mean for this particular problem? It means that if the limit as x approaches the joint which is 1 on the function equals the output then we'll satisfy condition 1 and then if the limit as x approaches the joint on the derivative function exists then we'll be differentiable. So let's test this one. In order for the limit to exist and equal the output I need to plug 1 into each branch and see if I get the same thing. If I plug 1 into this one I get a 1. If I plug 1 into this one I also get a 1. So we have continuity. We're ready to test the second thing. 
The second one, we look at the derivative, and here's where that power rule comes into play. It's very simple to take the derivative of the top. It's very simple to take the derivative of the bottom now. Each of those branches will be working for x is greater than 1 or x is less than 1, but we don't know about that equals yet because we don't know whether we're differentiable. So to test it, I'm going to plug a 1 into each branch. If I plug a 1 into this one, I get a negative 1. If I plug a 1 into this one, I get a 0. Those two do not match. So our conclusion is no, f of x is not differentiable at the joint. Now what I'd like you to do is do your web exam problems, as many of them as you can, so that you know which ones to ask about tomorrow, and consider the um, language objective, which is describe how that power rule made this process simpler and put it in your own words.